Hello sailors, I'm Captain Tom Tercy from the Maryland School of Sailing and Seamanship and I would like to introduce to you Captain Lee Tucker who will be speaking about storm tactics and use of the sea anchor. So here's Captain Lee Tucker. I'll begin by describing some of the dynamic forces at sea acting on a vessel and some strategies for coping with heavy seas, including avoidance, the practice of heaving to, and the use of drag devices, and discuss the uh, differences between sea anchors and droves and why one might have a preference for one over the other. Um, I'll present a case study of a instructional voyage in the Maryland School of Sailing in which we uh, had the opportunity to deploy a sea anchor, not just for fun, but of necessity, and follow with a detailed description of the components of a bow rig parachute anchor, including rigging and deployment, followed by retrieval. The Fastnet of 1979 is familiar to many of you uh, for the disaster that it represented. And I mention it really only because these large-scale sailing disasters magnify and give us the opportunity to analyze with large numbers of vessels the kinds of experiences that are shared by many of us when we go out sailing on the high seas or in rugged conditions. So, and, and because they receive so much attention and so much press, there has been a lot of analysis and critique of some of these events. And I'll share with you um, some statistical information from three of these. Uh, beginning with the Fastnet, 1979, which you realize now is over 30 years ago, 306 yachts left port and a third of those were knocked down in the course of the race. 76 were capsized and five sank outright. Seventy of these vessels were disabled and towed back in. Twenty-four were abandoned. And there were 15 fatalities. A truly a, a tragic event of major proportion. 136 sailors were airlifted. And interestingly, 26 of these 306 vessels chose to heave to under sail alone. And of those 26, None of them were rolled or sustained major damage to the vessel or to the rigging. And yet, 86 of these 300 boats chose to lay a hull as their strategy of coping with heavy seas. And another 46 ran before the wind or trailed warps in an attempt to slow the vessel's forward motion. These vessels accounted for the knockdowns and the capsizes and the sinkings and the major rig damage. No sea anchors were used, no drogues were deployed in the 79 Fastnet. Another example, if we fast forward 15 years, is the Queen's birthday storm. And as we study this uh, event as well, um, it was a pleasure cruise, essentially, of yachts leaving New Zealand headed for Tonga they encountered an intense low pressure system that you can see on the weather chart here um, to the east of New Zealand. There were sustained uh, knots of 60, uh, winds of 60 knots with gusts to 90. And all four of the boats that chose to lie a hull were knocked down more than 90 degrees. And these sustained uh, serious rigging damage and dismasting in some cases. Many vessels were capsized, many barrel rolls, and the quartermaster sank, killing three of the crew members. What's clear from our analysis of these large-scale disasters, Fastnet, the Queen's birthday storm, is that running before the storm and trailing warps or lying a hull didn't work. It wasn't an effective coping strategy with the high seas that were encountered. The reason for this is 
is that when you go to bear poles and you strip all the sails off the boat, you or you lie a hull, the boat typically wants to turn beam to the seas. And in fact, if you're disabled, if you lose your rudder or your steering or sails, if you're dismasted, it's estimated that 99% of today's yacht designs will lie beam to the sea. And why is this so bad? Well, it places the boat in a very vulnerable position to boarding waves, especially breaking waves. As the wave breaks, on the beam of a ship, it will have the tendency to knock it down, to cause a barrel roll. I just love that term. It's so descriptive. And of course, as the rig hits the water and the force is there, typically there's a dismasting that occurs. Not to mention all the chaos that occurs below deck with gear and provisions flying about the cabin, individuals being thrown into hard objects and banged heads and cracked ribs, etc. And those on deck fare a lot worse. They can be washed overboard. But what's also clear from these events and from the many, many years of sailing experience by others is that it's not really the wind strength itself that defines heavy weather. It's the sea state. It's been shown again and again that vessels that are well equipped to sail offshore with adequate storm sails can sail through hurricane force winds if they have reasonably flat water to do it in. Even with large waves, so long as they're non-breaking, even 100 feet or so, sailboats have been, over to, been able to sail over these waves safely and in control. That's not to say it's easy. It's exhausting to the crew, and it's hard on the boat, but it's possible to do it safely. It's the sea state that really defines heavy weather. So steep waves are one um, aspect of danger. As waves size for size, a steep wave is more dangerous and harder to sail through than a wave that is a nice relatively soft, gentle roller or swell of the same height. The next problem, though, occurs when waves begin to break. And I'll show you this in a little more detail in a moment, why breaking waves are so much more dangerous. But these conditions, given time, account for crew fatigue, and crew fatigue, all things being equal, is a more dangerous situation because you're less able to steer well through a heavy sea state or through a dangerous sea state and maintain uh, mental acuity and physical stamina with time. So there are points when we need to take evasive an action when we're confronted with these uh, scenarios. Waves begin to get steeper and steeper, they begin to break, and our crew is becoming fatigued. Now, this illustration from Victor Shane's reference, and I'll give it to you at the end of the presentation, shows why breaking waves are dangerous and why running with the heavy following sea or a large following sea is dangerous. First of all, if you can imagine a sailboat that is sailing along at seven knots over the crest of a wave, you have forward motion already propelling the vessel. But as this wave begins to break, and I'm not talking about the kind of foam and froth that you get over your tow rail when you are out sailing and you get some wash on the deck or the top of the wave starts to crumble a little bit, but these are the long curling overhanging crests that occur if you think about surfers, for instance, the kind of waves that surfers are in. Those are clearly breaking waves, and they occur at sea as well. These are quite dangerous because they transfer the potential wave energy into kinetic energy. And what happens is that wave breaks is it accelerates at 20 knots. 
with the full force of the water, the weight of the water behind it. Now there's another aspect to this though, to help you understand the dynamics at work. The vessel itself has buoyancy. It wants to float. And as this wave picks it up, and now the boat goes from a horizontal attitude to a vertical attitude, we have buoyancy that propels it forward due to its displacement, while gravitational forces want to pull it down. So now we have the boat being propelled forward by its forward motion added to it, the kick from the braking wave, its own buoyancy thrusting it forward while gravity pulls the bow down into the face of the oncoming wave, which might be moving at seven knots as well, tripping the bow and causing the boat to pitch pull. Now, that's an extreme example. At the very least, you might broach or turn the boat sideways, in which case you are not stern to any longer, you're broadside. And when you're broadside, you're very vulnerable to be rolled and capsized uh, for a reason I'll, I'll point out in just a moment. So these forces on the boat need to be understood when you are selecting the way of controlling your boat, the means of controlling your boat, whether it's with some sort of a device off the bow or off the stern. And you can see that devices rigged from the stern have an inherent um, danger about them by virtue of the actions of breaking waves in terms of um, potential for capsize. Not only that, but a cubic yard of seawater weighs about a ton. And so even the top of a small breaking wave can deliver 12 tons of water on deck, moving 20 knots. This is a very powerful uh, destabilizing uh, effect. It's one thing to have it on the foredeck, but imagine 10 tons of water hitting the cockpit and what that does for buoyancy and stability and trim of the boat. So this kinetic energy accounts for rolls, knockdowns, and at risk, of course, is your mast, the rudder, boom, but also windows and hatches and deck gear and anything that you have secured on deck can and will be broken away if the seas are rough enough and you're boarded by them. Some interesting work uh, performed at Southampton University and later published involved wave tank testing. These were tanks where waves were generated and a study of monohulls stability was performed. And the first study looked at the shape of the hull and where the ballast was located in the hull. Was it in a, a long keel? Was it in a thin keel or a deep bulb keel. And when they created breaking waves in this wave tank, and the breaking wave struck the whole beam on, they found that if that wave height was 55 percent of the length of the hull, it easily overwhelmed, meaning capsized, all combination of shape and ballast locations. So just over half the length of a boat. So what that means is if you're in a 40-foot boat and that wave was 20 feet or 21 feet, and a breaking wave hit the hull on the beam, it easily capsized all design combinations. But what's even more chilling, I think, is the next bit of information, that if that breaking wave was just 35% of the length, it rolled all designs over 130 degrees. And that's, that's a knockdown of major proportions. That buries the mast and the boom typically in the water and will typically end in losing the rig. Well, a third of the LOA is roughly what the beam is, if you think about it. So the way I prefer to think of this is that if you have a breaking wave about a third or of your length or equal to your beam, 
then you're at risk for being rolled or capsized or knocked down if that breaking wave hits you on the beam. So a typical 40-foot sailboat might have a beam of 13 feet. If you have a 13-foot breaking wave, you're in peril if it strikes you on the beam. And so we're going to spend some time talking about the practice of heaving to, how to do it, and why it works. The principle of heaving to, before we talk about how to do it, is the practice of bringing the boat up into the wind and stalling it so that you essentially stop all meaningful forward motion. You might foreach it a half a knot or so, or a quarter knot, but the boat is essentially drifting downwind. The wind has, because of the windage of the boat, it is blowing the boat downwind where it is moving forward, if at all, very slowly. And this property of heaving to creates a slick in the water, an area of disturbed water. So you can see in this diagram, as the boat is moving downwind, it has the property of disturbing the breaking waves. And that's beneficial to the boat, so now they can't break on the boat. The wind is still howling, it's still somewhat rough, but we don't have the danger of the breaking wave and all of that kinetic energy striking the beam of the boat. So the key is to bring the boat up into the wind so that it stalls and ceases having any significant forward motion. This in turn stabilizes the boat and quiets it down so that it, it actually improves safety on deck for crew members to move around to take care of sails or anything on deck that needs to be managed, either removing extra gear, or relashing gear, whatever needs to be done, or just to give the crew a rest. So we'll talk next about how to heave to with various types of vessels. Sloops and cutters, which constitute the largest number of recreational cruising boats today, will typically heave to uh, under only a reefed main or a storm trysail. Now, this is contrary to what you read about in the textbooks and in the sailing magazine articles, which really date from a, uh, a previous era when a large number of gaff rig vessels uh, sailed. And I'll, I'll show you why that is. The principle here, of course, is to have the sail, the mainsail or the trysail rig so that it drives the boat up into the wind, but then stalls. And with most sloops and cutters, there's enough windage forward of the mast to in turn blow the bow down so that it counteracts the drive from the reefed main or the trysail. And by balancing the trim on the trysail or the reefed main, it's possible to drive the bow back up into the wind to the point that it stalls. So unlike what is commonly published uh, as authoritative advice of tacking the boat and backwinding the Genoa. If you do that with most loops and cutters, you will end up, instead of 45 to 50 degrees off the wind, you'll end up 60 to 90 degrees off the wind, and that's exactly where you don't want to be. You don't want to have the seas on your beam. So if you've tried to do this, and 17% of you said you weren't happy with the results, it might be because the Genoa was used to and backwinded, and you don't need that extra windage up on the bow. Uh, the main or the uh, the reefed main or trysail will be adequate to point the boat up and to stall. A gaff rigger is different uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, and the primary reason, 
is the shape of the, the mainsail. When you reef a gaff rigger, the center of effort of that mainsail moves aft because of the shape of the sail. And because of that, it's a greater lever to turn the boat into the wind, and you need something forward of the mainmast. In this case, we have a gaff rig schooner to bring that bow back down out of the wind or you'll go up into irons. So with the gaff rigger, it's a balance because the center of effort is so far aft. And I've exaggerated it by showing you a, an image of a schooner. But the same thing might apply to a schooner as well, where the center of effort is so far aft. Okay, So it's a matter of balancing the forward drive from the main and the windage in the fore triangle. The next rig type, then, is the catch and yaw, which we've um, covered a little bit tangentially. The catch and a yaw um, give you more sail combinations and more opportunities to balance out the rig. And you typically will not need head sail with these combinations because if you're getting too much drive from the mizzen, you could strike the mizzen and just run the main up and it gives you less leverage uh, to counteract the fore triangle. So I can't make broad generalizations on how to heave to in a catcher yaw except to say that for the most part you won't need, unless it's gaff rigged, you won't need a Genoa back winded. You can heave to very nicely under a deeply reefed main or if you have a storm trisail or a reefed mizzen, or possibly even a combination of the two, depending on wind conditions. As the wind pipes up, the need for the second sail is mitigated, and in fact, it's better to have less sail. So the key here is to practice on your boat. And just to summarize heaving two, most vessels that are Marconi rigged, in other words, sloops, cutters, schooners, catches, non-gaff rigged vessels typically heave to with tri seal or deeply reef main or mizzen only. Gaffers typically need a back stay sailor jib and it's great fun and good practice to do this on your boat and to see what it will do in various wind conditions and the amount of sail you need in the combination will change as the wind increases and the one thing that will be in common with all scenarios is as the wind increases the amount of sail you have up will decrease to maintain comfort and stability. Well, let's see. Now, it's 1998, uh, 20 years after Fastnet. Have we learned much in the 20 years accumulated experience and all of the publicity and then, of course, all the individual stories of um, heavy conditions at sea? Well, this was sponsored by the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia. 630 nautical mile race and many of you are familiar with this story it happened played out over Christmas um, 1998 there were 115 starters about a third of the fast net opening but only 44 finished five sank 66 vessels retired 55 sailors airlifted off their vessels or out of the water, and six fatalities. So proportionately, the number of fatalities and disabled vessels uh, mirrored those of, of um, Fastnet. And on the surface, we haven't really gained much ground in coping with severe conditions at sea. In fact, the uh, review committee of the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia the following year issued this statement. The committee's investigation into drogues, sea anchors, and parachute anchors, or even a makeshift alternative, shows their use would have been a sound option in the conditions of the 1998 race. And yet, for the most part, we're not used. So what are these drag devices that um, the committee is referring to? They've been around uh, the modern history, goes back centuries. They've probably been around for millennia. A fishermen have been using them for years. They've come in various types. Um, 
Some have been makeshift from scraps of sail, uh, tires, chains, uh, warps, some heavily constructed of metal, wood, canvas, uh, on up to the modern uh, parachute sea anchors, which began uh, by using surplus military parachutes. So they come in a variety of um, designs and uh, uses, and the fundamental distinction between them is whether they're deployed off the bow or off the stern. And based on what we've been discussing so far, you probably are concluding that I might not be in favor of throwing these off the stern of the boat. But let's, let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of both and look at the advantages and disadvantages. Well, certainly the bow offers a strong attachment point for ground anchors. So it might be a reasonable place to attach sea anchors and the related gear as well. The bow is certainly designed to face a head sea. It's a strong, ruggedly constructed part of the boat. And it protects the cockpit from spray, uh, breaking waves, boarding waves. And if you rig a storm trysail, this can provide some redundancy to laying to a sea anchor. And I'll show you how that works in a few minutes. The stern has some um, advantages, stern rigging. I don't want to be totally dismissive of the idea because it does allow you to continue active sailing. If your intent is to continue to sail and you're able to do so, and the need is only to slow the boat down, warps have been trailed. These are lines, either uh, anchor lines or even chain, dragged behind the boat, will slow the boat down and allow you to continue sailing under a little more control. If in doing so, you're heading in the direction you want to go. There's some advantage to being able to maintain course. Warps trailed off the port or starboard quarter can be used in a fashion to crudely steer the boat in an emergency in the event that there's a steering failure. It allows you, rigged off the stern, to drift with the wind. And again, if that's the direction you want to go, there may be some advantage in doing that. But I think you'll see when we talk about disadvantages, there's a big difference. Now, with respect to bow uh, rig drag devices, you have to make sure that if you rig your boat to one of these, that you do have adequate sea room between you and a lee shore. You have to also be cognizant that you may back down on the rudder. And because you're in a drift, either to an anchor or hove to, the rudder is now vulnerable. And you can avoid this if you're not backing straight down on the rudder, but if you're 45, 40, 50 degrees off of the anchor and you rig control lines, which I'll show in the next slide. This can stabilize the rudder and protect it from being suddenly slammed down on the stern if you were caught in a wave. The boat, if you're just lying to a sea anchor, can, the boat motion can be very uncomfortable. If you don't heave to and you simply deploy a drag device off the bow, then you have the full brunt of the breaking seas or whatever sea state you're experiencing hitting you on the bow or on the port or the starboard side of the bow, yawing the boat around, and it's very uncomfortable. And I've done this. I don't recommend it. Um, it might be necessary under some circumstances if you're dismasted, for example. But um, I'm going to emphasize today using the techniques of heaving to and a bow anchor as a system for survival at sea. Now, the disadvantages of deploying off the stern are significant. Again, you have to be concerned that you have adequate sea room. But it also exposes the cockpit to wind and seas, and not just spray, but boarding seas and getting pooped and the property that they have of destabilizing the boat. If you've been sailing to windward and now you turn your stern to the wind, you can lose those miles made to windward, and they were hard won. 
And uh, it's very disheartening to give all that mileage up if you're offshore and you turn your stern to the wind. The other aspect of rigging to a stern anchor is loss of rudder control, especially in wave crests and in breakers. The helm goes squirrely, and it's important to maintain this control to resist being turned on your beam end for the danger that that puts you in. The stern of most boats is simply not designed to be an attachment point for ground anchors or sea anchors. And again, let's think about the dynamic forces acting on the boat and remember the danger of the brooch in the pitch pole. And something that you don't really think about until you've actually done it, but it is a bear getting these back in once you've deployed them. Um, you try to back up on them and retrieve them. You run the risk of fouling. Uh, you power forward. You have them up along the side of the boat, and um, you have that issue as well. I'm going to, uh, with Larry Party's uh, permission, quote him from his video, and I'll, I'll give you the reference at the end of the presentation. Um, if you choose to um, purchase it, I know Larry would be appreciative. In this uh, quote, he, um, he says, uh, you're probably going to ask what's going to happen in 70 or 80 knots of wind. Try to stave ho to as long as possible with your trysail or sails. Because for one thing, it's a lot easier than putting out all that pair of anchor gear. But if you no longer stay behind your slick, you do need some assistance to hold you there. And a method that's worked surefire for us in the past is to put the parachute anchor out. And this stops your forward motion completely. And you stay behind your slick and out of the braking seas. OK, next I'll. Um, describe for you how a sea anchor is rigged, the components of it, how to deploy it with a, a case study example of a sea anchor in, in use. Now beginning with the boat, um, off the bow we have a road that's typically 10 to 15 times the overall length of the boat, an optional bit of chain which may or may not be used, a shackle and typically a swivel to moderate or eliminate rotation of the parachute, a stowage bag which just remains with the parachute once it's deployed, and a trip line which actually begins here as a float line that comes from the crown of the parachute up to a float. Now this is important because the sea anchor is going to sink with all of this weight and the float line is typically about 30 feet or so in length. The reason this length is important is it keeps the parachute from sinking, but also if the parachute were to float on the surface, it would pull out of the top of some of these large steep waves. So you want it buried down in the water, but you don't want it to sink too far. Some parachutes are rigged with an optional trip line, and I'll be describing all of these components in greater detail. But if there is a trip line, it extends from the float, which is responsible for the buoyancy of the parachute, out perhaps even 100 feet or so, 100, 150 feet, to a little float here for retrieval. Pulling on this trip line will collapse the canopy of the parachute and assist in bringing it out of the water and on board. Now, Larry Party. Lynn and Larry Party have developed a system for helping the boat maintain its attitude to a sea anchor while hove to. So in Party's system, the boat is already hove to at an angle of 45 or 50 degrees to the wind. And rather than simply deploy the sea anchor off the bow, he deploys a pennant with a snatch block that comes back to a stern cleat or a winch. And this allows you to adjust from the cockpit the angle of the boat to the sea anchor. It's a, a little bit of redundancy for what you're doing with the sails when you're hove to, so that 
the two systems are complementary and they reinforce each other. So this has become known as the party bridle, and I recommend its use. Imagine this drift now as you're drifting on wind and you're held in position by the sea anchor. The tendency of the boat, if it was to sail forward at a half or a knot at forward speed, would be essentially pinned in place by the sea anchor and held in its position in a slick while the boat, the sea anchor, and all the rigging drift downwind. Here's an example off the coast of South Africa in about 35 knots of wind. Uh, Larry Party on board this boat, and although the picture is not uh, very high resolution, they're inshore and the wind is blowing offshore, so they're not dealing with steep waves. But what I want to point out is this area of relatively undisturbed water in the vicinity of the boat. The boat is actually drifting downwind away from the sea anchor, which is deployed here. And barely visible in this picture is the bridle, which comes back to um, an attachment point on the boat. Now, as you can imagine, in high seas and heavy wind, um, there are failure points in any kind of a, a rig like this. And the sea anchor failures, as I've come to understand them, are most often related to chafe. So it's very important to have adequate chafe gear on board to protect the line, and I'll, I'll show you some examples. Now, in addition to that, um, there's a lot of stress that is created on some of the hardware by virtue of the scope of the sea anchor itself being insufficient. I mentioned it should be 10 to 15 times the length of the boat. If the scope is too short, the loads that are placed on the on the deck gear and on the hardware uh, are much greater and it puts them at greater risk for failing. So we want to make sure that we have adequate scope, make sure that the road itself is adequate size and that the hardware used to join all this, the shackles, the swivels, etc., are of adequate size as well. To understand how to properly design and equip a sea anchor system, it's necessary to come back to a diagram and, and understand the forces that occur on a boat. Whether it's a sea anchor or a ground anchor, you have forces that are in common. The load that is on the sea anchor road itself is a combination of forces. Part of this is wind drag by the windage of the boat, the superstructure above the water line, and the wind strength combined to create this force. There's a gravitational force, backsliding force. Gravity wants to pull the boat down a wave. That contributes to the force. And buoyancy. The boat naturally wants to float. And as a wave swell hits the boat, the boat will be uh, forced up, and that will put strain on the road as well. And all of these can be determined and factor into your selection of sea anchor gear. An example of wind loading forces, a combination of both the volume of the boat, what kind of um, a footprint does it present to the wind, can be determined by the overall length of the boat in combination with the beam. So that the wind load is not strictly proportional to the length overall, but it's the length in combination with the beam, so that you can see as the um, um, length of the boat, say 25 feet, and 15 knots of wind, the force might be 125. Doubling the length of the boat brings the force up to 400, and that is because of the effect of the beam as well. So the volume of the boat has greater windage than simply would be predicted by the length of the boat. But a very powerful uh, force, obviously, um, to be reckoned with is the wind velocity. The principle is that as the wind velocity 
doubles or increases arithmetically, the velocity, the force that is exerted on the boat increases exponentially, and the exponent is the square of the wind velocity. So with a doubling of wind velocity, we see that the force increases four times. So that we could potentially um, find a 40-foot boat with an 11-foot average beam, let's say, in 60 knots of wind would be expected to have a force of 4,800 pounds, um, theoretical, obviously. Now, fortunately, we don't have to do these calculations. The manufacturers of this anchor gear have done the engineering for us, and there are charts available from the manufacturers. This one is from Paratech, but most of the manufacturers supply these. You take the boat's length overall, and there's a range typically given. And in this case, they use displacement. And they combine all of this, and they give you basically a size of a sea anchor that would be appropriate for your conditions. And these would be up to and including severe storm conditions. So we wouldn't have to make special allowance for the wind strength. Uh, they also have determined the safe working limit of um, the anchor road so that the road is sized appropriately. And this is very important to specify this polymer of nylon, 6-6, is premium nylon, um, the highest strength, highest quality nylon uh, available for road. And I'll talk a little bit about the different types of braid material in just a moment. Uh, this is a typical sea anchor as it's applied by Paratech. Uh, the outer storage bag is part of the um, unit. And this is a shackle that comes supplied with the sea anchor. And laid out on a dock, as you see here, is the anchor bag and the crown of the anchor, which is open at the top, typically has some nylon webbing. And this allows water to pass through the crown, especially if it's lifted in an inverted position. And then some shrouds, which typically are composed of nylon webbing, they come down to uh, meet at some hardware. Now, uh, I mentioned the scope, how important the scope was, the length of the anchor road. Um, here's a graphic illustration of why that's important. This, by the way, is single braid nylon, uh, nylon 66 nylon with a stainless thimble, which uh, to me is the ideal road material. Now on this upper chart, we have a road that's one to two times the length of the boat. And in the bottom panel, it's 10 to 15 times. It's the recommended length. And I've drawn this red line across, this dotted line across both charts to show you the loading on this graphical depiction. As the road is placed under load, you can see that the shock loads here are much higher for the short scope road than they are for the long scope road. So there's a much greater margin of safety here. If you're going to have a failure, it's going to be when you get one of these peak, more likely than not, one of these peak uh, spikes in the load that's placed on your deck gear and hardware. So the scope is very important. What this means is for a 40-foot boat, you're talking about 400 to 600 feet of road. The type of road is important. Um, I have a number of illustrations um, just for convenience of this three strand. Uh, the preferred road in my view and, and many others is this single braid 6-6 um, six, six nylon. Also in Europe it's called multi-plate. Now three strand has been around a long time and certainly its characteristics are well known. But one of the problems with three strand in this application is because the road is so long and we're dealing with a parachute in the water, it has a tendency to twist. When the line twists, it can unravel partially and jam itself. And um, this is called hocking. And that has the, the tendency to create knots in the line and weaken the line, ultimately. Now, double braid, we're all pretty familiar with, is our typical 
running rigging on our boats and of course has a higher brake strength on average. The reason we don't prefer it in this application is it consists of a braid over a braid and in loading and unloading conditions as you have in a sea anchor situation where it's cycled again and again over hours or even potentially days, there's a lot of friction inside this line and friction is not your friend. Friction will generate heat and heat weakens nylon. And the problem with this, of course, is the theoretical average brake strength is reduced in practice so that this, the choice is single braid because of its construction. It doesn't generate as much heat when it's placed under load. And as a result, it maintains a greater percentage of its average braking strength in use. The type of nylon is important. Specify type 6.6. Don't take what they give you off the spool. Ask for it by type. It, it's significantly better than simply type 6, which is the lower grade uh, nylon typically provided. Now, a word about the party bridle and how to construct that. This is an application for three-strand nylon. And again, 6-6 six, six grade is important. The reason you can use and should use nylon three strand here is the length is relatively short. It's just one to one and a half boat lengths. It's extending from your typically a Genoa winch forward to your anchor road where it's attached with a thimble to a snap shackle. And it's captive at both ends, so it won't twist. It won't hock, and develop knots in it, and weaken. And it has some stretch, a little greater stretch, which is nice for shock loading in this application. I'll show you in more detail how to rig all that and tie it together in a moment. Also, just have your eye to detail when it comes to selecting your other hardware, such as screw pin shackles. Go with the safe working load of this hardware, not the braking load, and be mindful of that. But also, when you look at swivels, remember that size for size, a swivel has a lower safe working load than a shackle. For instance, if we select a half inch shackle with a 4,000 pound uh, safe working load, that same uh, half inch swivel will only have 3,600 pound working load. You need to go up a size in every case, a half to five eighths, five eighths to three quarters to compensate for this inherent um, relative weakness of, shack of swivels. And this is due to the pin that is welded in the swivel. Now, if you're able to find the forged swivels that are used by commercial fishermen and um, tow boats, tugboats and such, um, get those, they're much stronger. They have a forged pin as opposed to this welded pin and um, are much, much stronger. If you use chain, chain is completely optional. Um, I don't use chain personally, but if you choose to, remember to go with a safe working load depending on whether you're dealing with conventional um, chain or with uh, some form of um, high tensile chain. And whenever you're using snatch blocks or turning blocks of any sort, if you can get the manufacturer's data from safe working uh, load limits, use that. If it's older gear, inspect it carefully and make sure that it's up to the task and oversize it whenever possible. Well, there's a lot involved in preparing a boat for an offshore departure, and the punch list for the vessel and the crew is a lengthy one. Um, we obviously don't have time to go through all of that now. It would make a wonderful webinar uh, in the future, and um, we'll, we'll consider doing that. What I'd like to focus on right now the, is a sea anchor checklist for pre-departure and what you need to have on your boat and how to set it up before you leave the dock to make sure that you're prepared when the situation arises. As I've been describing for you, um, you need to identify 
what will be a properly sized parachute anchor, um, a float of adequate buoyancy to lift and keep the entire um, parachute and road and shackles up off the seabed, a trip line if you care to rig it, uh, the bridle, the turning blocks, the snatch blocks, and the attachment points on the boat, um, whether you're using uh, cleats or winches should be appropriate to the task. Chafe gear um, is very important to tie around um, the road and possibly the bridle, anywhere it might come in contact with the deck fitting or another piece of hardware. Um, I like to use the two inch fire hose which can be found easily uh, as the fire departments are replacing their hose. Um, the heavy wall uh, clear plastic tubing can be slipped on as well and tied in place. Storm sails, uh, particularly the tri sail I'll um, describe that for you in a little more detail. We've had a question about that. You want to go ahead and rig the storm tri sail at the mast, uh, preferably if you have an external um, um, mast track or one that's uh, cast into the extrusion, an internal track, Go ahead and run the tri-sail up and get it rigged at the dock and make sure that your sheets are long enough and your halyard is long enough. Everything is appropriate and, um, and functional. And then stow it um, at the base of the mast. Take the sea anchor out of its bag and all of its components, open it up, spread it out, make sure all the lines lead fair. and then rig it to the boat and make sure that the road comes in to the bow and is free of um, the bow rollers, uh, the bow pulpit. You probably have your ground anchors. You're going to need to stow those and get them out of the way so they're not conflicting with the sea anchor road. And uh, tie some rudder control lines. I think they're in the next slide. I'll show you how to do that. And then put the sea anchor gear away where it's accessible, typically a lazarette uh, where it can be reached. You've got a parachute bag and a, a big bag or two of sea anchor road and the bridle as well to be reachable when uh, conditions deteriorate. Now, if you haven't rigged um, a rudder control line before uh, on your boat, you need to look at the rudder and see if it has a provision for this. If you anticipate going offshore and having uh, finding yourself in conditions where you may need to heave to um, in rugged conditions, identify uh, on the rudder whether there is a provision for running a control line through. If not, you can have your rudder modified uh, and a drilling placed through it to uh, accommodate a control line. It needs the rudder stock obviously needs to be able to um, withstand uh, tension on these lines, so be careful and make sure that it's, it's done professionally. But the line basically runs through, you can either um, knot it off at the top or run two lines with a bowline on each, whatever your rudder stock will allow you to do, and run these up ahead of time up over the transom or the side of the boat and tie them off so that you have enough uh, swing room to control the rudder or the starboard, but not so much dangling in the water that you run the risk of fouling a prop, for example. The storm tri-sail um, is rigged at the dock. Go ahead and slide, um, install it in the um, mast track and tie the halyard on or um, clip it on and hoist it all the way up. Then drop it and stow it, uh, flake it down, fold it up and stick it in a bag. And ideally, this bag would be tied to the base of the mast and secured with lashings so that before you go offshore, it's right there and ready to go. And all you need to do is bring a halyard down and clip onto it after your main scale is dropped and you're ready to uh, feed it on up through the mast track if it's not on currently and, um, and set the sail.
to tie it up at that point. So going back to the overall configuration of our, our bridle here with uh, the bridle line coming back to the cockpit and the road coming off of the bow through the snatch block to the sea anchor itself, we have the following components. We have the anchor itself and its little storage bag. We have at the end of the shrouds, we have a shackle and a swivel. And then through uh, the pin is through a um, thimble on the end of the anchor road. The anchor road then in turn passes through another snatch block which goes to the bridle back to a general primary winch so it can be adjusted. And the um, road continues on forward to the bow where it probably will need a turning block of some sort to clear bow pulpit, etc., before it can be cleated off on uh, some secure deck hardware. Now also then leading from the bag is the float line. And the float line is indicated here. And to that is tied a float, sufficient buoyancy to keep the thing afloat. And if you elect to do this, you can also tie on to this webbing a trip line, which allows you then 100, 150 feet of sea space to pick this up before you approach the um, parachute under sail. And so here um, at higher power are the individual components. And this little swivel here at the end of the float line, um, at higher power, this um, swivel, this the webbing goes back to the parachute. And we have a swivel. And you tie the end of the float to the downstream end of the swivel. In other words, you want the parachute, which is over attached to this, to be able to spin if, it, if it's going to without fouling the float. That's the purpose of that little swivel. So make sure you tie it to the end away from the parachute so that the parachute can freely turn on the swivel. And then if you attach a trip line, it would be over here and it would continue on like so back to its little storage bag. And the little bag here for the trip line has foam flotation built into it so that it automatically floats after it pays out. And then a, a close-up view of the uh, bridle configuration. Here is our um, anchor road, single braid, and a nice uh, big snatched block you can see here. And then um, there's a snap shackle here, which would be seized down either with cable ties or with uh, stainless wire. And a um, thimble then for our bridle line at this point. So practice rigging all this stuff on the dock and on your boat before you set out. That's the important message here. Uh, close, close up of the shrouds of the parachute anchor coming up to the swivel and now this, uh, the shackle and then the swivel itself and swivel on this thimble. And again, as I said, I prefer single braid. Uh, I've got three strand here in this illustration. After you've got all this out on the dock and you're satisfied that it's um, complete, and adequately rigged, and going to clear all the components on the boat, it's time to repack it in the bag. And I've, I've had the pleasure of sailing with some um, Air Force uh, active duty uh, servicemen, and they showed me how to pack a proper parachute uh, for jumping out of an airplane. But uh, however neat and pretty it is, it's really not necessary. And the manufacturer recommends simply gathering it up and then carefully folding it into the bag as you go. Helps to have plenty of help here. And gather it up and just accordion fold it into the top of the bag like so. So once you've got the parachute itself folded into the bag, now you, you have to deal with the shrouds. And this is critical to do this properly. You gather up the shrouds and you eliminate any kinks or tangles. And the storage bag has a series of, uh, at least in the Paratech gear, 
uh, vinyl flaps. So as the shrouds are flaked down into the bag, these uh, hand over hand in an accordion fold, I think you can see um, one of these flaps here outside of the bag. The flaps then are placed over the shrouds ever three or four folds so that they pay out smoothly without tangling on themselves. And then you continue with the packing, two or three folds, and then a flap is placed in on top. Now we're at the heavy webbing, and then it is flat on top. And now we're down to the shackle on the end of the swivel. And this is um, shackled to the outside of the bag to the nylon webbing handle. And at that point, we have um, completely packed uh, the parachute anchor. The next item to be gathered up is the road. And again, this is not single braid, obviously. What you do here is you take the shackle, the thimbled end, which is shackled to the parachute, to the swivel, and the bitter end, which will go up to the bow and attach to the boat. And bring them together and then find the midpoint of this line. And place the midpoint down in a bag and flake the line into the bag on itself so that it'll pay out freely as you go. It's nice to have plenty of helpers here, offshore crew getting ready to leave St. Thomas. Now, once that's all stowed away, um, you're ready in the event that um, the situation demands. And such a situation uh, presented itself um, in 2006 in an instructional voyage for the Maryland School for uh, ASA 108. Um, it'll serve as a case study for the steps that you would take as the weather deteriorates and you make the decision to deploy a sea anchor. I hope you'll find it uh, illustrative. Um, the crew members here um, were a, a terrific crew to work with. Uh, we had two days in Norfolk uh, preparing for the voyage. And although we normally uh, typically um, rig this to the boat and at the dock, um, we don't often get the situation to uh, the opportunity to deploy it in real storm conditions. And uh, those conditions presented themselves to us. A uh, little word about the vessel, first of all. Um, the vessel that was used is an island packet 440 cutter, length overall about 45 feet, displacing 32,000 pounds with a beam of 14 feet 4 inches and a draft of 5 feet. Um, you can see uh, from this uh, half model, the um, keel configuration shows extensive cutaway of the forefoot and a skeg mounted rudder. The mainsail was a seven ounce uh, fully battened, four full battens with two reef points, and the boat was fitted with a 10 ounce storm trisail that constituted 17% of the surface area of the mainsail and was fitted with a 18-foot Paratech sea anchor. Um, after several days at sea, um, at about 27 degrees north latitude and 69 degrees west longitude, uh, we experienced three days of force 8, 9, and 10 wind in the range of 34 to 55 knots. Uh, this was due to two advancing strong low pressure systems which uh, collided and we were caught between them. Um, seas built to 33 feet and we're beginning to break. I'll walk you through each of these three days and what we experienced and what we did. Um, on day one of this three day period, uh, we'll start with the wind at 30 knots, gusting to 38. Uh, the seas were 12 to 15 feet, but were not breaking. We were sailing under a stay sail only and a doubly reefed mainsail, having already furled the Genoa. 
So we elected at this point, in view of the wind strength and the fact that it was building and gusting to 38, to drop the doubly reefed main. And that's what we're in the process of doing here. Here's the halyard. And here's the head of the sail. Our crew is um, holding it against the boom. And it's being lashed down to the boom. And at that point, we raised the storm trysail. And we kept the stay sail. So we found that the stay sail and the storm trysail together gave us nice balance ahead of and behind the mast, good control. And we were able to sail along at 7 half knots, about 60 degrees from the apparent wind. Um, it's important to remember when the wind pipes up to clear unnecessary gear from the top sides. Um, in this case, it caught us a little by surprise. So this is also known as removing the bimini and 40 knots of apparent wind. And it took five crew members to get this uh, bimini down and under control. Um, you run the risk of damaging it or the frame in winds of this uh, magnitude. You may even, in extreme conditions, need to clear the dodger as well. Now on day two, um, conditions intensified. And the wind now is blowing a solid 35 knots with gusts of 40. You can see that we've got the rain gear on now. Seas uh, built from 15 to 22 feet, uh, but they were still not breaking. We were sailing along uh, very nicely, still with the stay sail, which you can see in this picture, as well as the storm tri sail. And now we were moving along at about 8 knots, wind about 60 degrees apparent. And we really felt that we were on the edge at this point of being overpowered. We had as much drive and as much speed as we felt that we could safely handle given um, um, the sea state and the crew that we had. Well, early uh, the next morning, day three, uh, continuing to rain uh, with water spouts all around us, uh, conditions deepened to force 10. Uh, wind was now solid 45, gusting to 50. The seas had built uh, from 25 to 30 feet and were beginning to break on us. Um, we elected then at this point to furl the stay sail. So we got the stay sail in, and this left us sailing along under the storm tri sail only. And even so, we were moving along at about eight and a half knots and felt that we were uh, even then overpowered. And as a result, we elected to heave to. We could have continued to try to sail, but at eight and a half knots, we're really at the theoretical hull speed of the boat. Uh, we were heeling at a, an angle that um, felt to be um, uncomfortable. And um, so what we simply did here was point up into the wind. We were already sailing along at 60 degrees. We pointed up 40 to 45 degrees. And we stalled the boat at that point and we hove to. Now, um, later in the day, uh, conditions uh, continued to intensify. Uh, still force 10, blowing 45, gusting to 55. Seas now 33 feet and breaking. Uh, we were hove to under the storm tri sail alone, but we were fore reaching. We were moving forward out of our slick at about a maximum of 1.4 knots. So what this meant was we were no longer able to maintain our position in the slick. Now, we were earlier in the day, but as the wind increased, our ability to stall the boat uh, decreased. And we started to foreach. And this is not unusual uh, when you're hove to um, as the wind increases give, with a given amount of sail. So at this point, we decided to set the sea anchor and to hold ourselves in position with um, um, within the slick. And in fact, that was accomplished. And we found rather than fore reaching or moving forward at 1.4 knots, all forward motion was stopped. And according to our GPS, we began to drift 1.2 knots downwind, staying within the slick. And we laid to the sea anchor for a total of seven hours.
before we retrieved it. Now just to, to recap how we set this up on this particular boat, we had storm tri sail uh, set, no other sails. We rigged a par D bridle and the road then came out to a parachute anchor, no chain, deployment bag and float. Uh, there was no trip line rigged on this particular sea anchor. So we just had a float and that was the extent of our rig at that point. Let me um, quote from Larry Party again. Uh, remember, we don't recommend lying to a sea anchor alone. We feel you should lay hove to 45 or 50 degrees from the wind with a steadying sail, a riding sail. This is much safer and easier on your rudder more comfortable, and if one of the other items, say the tri-seal blows out, you're still hove to in the correct position with the para-anchor and the bridle. And vice versa, if you lost your parachute, the sails would hold you hove to. So our system is heaving to, and the para-anchor only helps you stay in the hove to position. I, I regard this uh, as sound advice and a real innovation and step forward in our approach to uh, uh, conducting ourselves at sea. To um, rig the parachute anchor at sea, um, it's important to remember that you rig and deploy the anchor on the windward side of the boat. The steps that you will take are as follows. Um, once you decide that you're going to deploy the sea anchor, you open the road bag in the cockpit and identify the two ends. Remember, it's blowing uh, pretty hard, and it wouldn't take much to get this line out of control. So keep it in the bag and just identify the two ends. Shackle the um, thimble on your road to the swivel and seize the shackle pin with either a cable tie or, or a wire. Then you walk the bitter end forward or crawl, however conditions demand. You take the bitter end and go outside of all rigging and walk it up to the bow while a crew member in the cockpit maintains a little bit of tension on the road to keep it from flying off into the rigging and tangling on something. It, it just wants to do that, so you have to keep a little tension on it. You run it all the way up to the bow and you shackle it to a turning block which you've already established ahead of time will give you a fair lead. And then you seize that shackle. Now, up on the bow, you need to find a good attachment point. And many boats have, as part of the stem fitting or um, part of the bow roller uh, configuration, will have a strong attachment point where you can place a shackle. You're going to need to remember this runs outside of all rigging, outside of the bow pulpit. And you're going to need a turning block to get this line uh, in, make a fair lead, and then secure to cleats other strong points uh, up on the bow. You can run it down uh, to a bow cleat and then back to a midship cleat, uh, to both bow cleats, as if you were towing a boat, and apply your chafe gear. The anchors are going to have to come out of the rollers and stowed away. And be careful of this kind of situation where you have fair lead with the turning block, but you've got some other deck hardware here. In this case, it's, a, it's an anchor that will um, uh, eventually chafe through on this line if you don't um, clear it off ahead of time. So you run the bitter end forward outside of all rigging through a bow turning block, and then either your primary crew member or assistant comes up and lightly ties this road outside of the stanchions. I like to tie it with little six inch plastic cable ties to the stanchion bases. The reason for this is they're going to be sacrificial and you need to attach the road to the boat in some way that will prevent the road from tangling or fouling on a stanchion or um, um, on a derate or some other portion of the rigging. And 
the reason for this will be apparent in just a moment as we set to deploy the anchor. So hopefully now the sea anchor um, road is um, outboard of all rigging. It's tied to stanchion bases with some sacrificial cable ties, or easy to tie, and run around through a turning block at the bow to uh, cleats and other strong attachment points. Next, in the cockpit, you tie your float to the trip line swivel. And remember, away from the parachute anchor so that the swivel will turn freely. And if you happen to have a trip line as well, that's great. If you don't, then this is the end of your rig right here with the float. Next, you rig the bridle. This should already be in a bag. Nylon three strand, you take the thimble and you attach that thimble to the shackle that is on your bridle and you run that the road, the anchor road through the block and then you seize uh, the block as well as the shackle closed so they cannot open. Okay, so the block then is kept on board until you're ready to deploy and your anchor road is coming back to the cockpit now. It's having already been shackled to the um, uh, swivel on the parachute anchor. The bitter end of the bridle comes through a turning block to the Genoa primary winch. And this shows the um, parachute anchor already deployed uh, for clarity, but here is the anchor road coming from the bow. And here's the snap shackle and the bridle line right here, the three strand. And if you follow this three strand up, it comes through a turning block which happens to be shackled to a cleat and it turns up to this Genoa primary winch and load the winch up with all the turns you can get on the winch to distribute the load. This will allow you then to control the attitude of the boat relative to the sea anchor. Remember to seize all the shackles, shackle pins closed. So in essence what we've done is we've taken the anchor road and we just tacked it lightly to stanchion bases and then run it onto the bow and attached it there. So you can see what will happen when we go to deploy this. We cast it over the side of the boat and as the water fills and opens the parachute, the wind will blow the boat down and it will begin to pop off these sacrificial lashings so that then the boat will go bow to the wind and start to pull and load up the parachute anchor. So getting it ready for deployment, we have the bridle here in my right hand. And this is the bridle line. It's coming down. It's going to come through the block and be wrapped around this winch. And then over here, we have the thimble and the shackle for the snatch block and the anchor road illustrated here. Next, the float is cast overboard. The float, again, is tied to the webbing that, in this case, takes it to the parachute anchor. Now here you can see that the float now has trailed off. This is about 30 feet, and the anchor has started to open. When um, casting the parachute into the water, after uh, throwing the uh, float overboard, one takes the bag that uh, the parachute is packed in and you invert it, open it up and make sure that everything is going to fall out freely and slam dunk it into the water. Now what this will do will help the shackle, the weight of the shackle, pull the shrouds out of the bag and they will begin to sink. As they sink, then the canopy will begin to open. And this it takes a while for this to occur. It, um, it's surprising to me the first time I did it. It takes a matter of minutes for this parachute to deploy and to open up. But as it does, it'll begin to put strain on the road. And now it'll put strain on the bridle line as well. 
and you can winch in or ease the bridle line to get you to the optimum angle, which I would say is about 45 to 50 degrees. It's not a matter of simply of setting this and going down and going to sleep, although you may want to. Um, a couple of important things you need to do. If you haven't secured rudder control lines by now, and hopefully you did when you hove to, by all means make sure that you have them um, tensioned up so, and the wheel locked so that there's no um, avenue to back down on the rudder and, and break it. It's also important to check for chafe on a regular basis. I like to do it every half hour, top and bottom of the hour. It's part of the uh, watch duties. Um, crawl up on deck if you have to crawl to get up to the bow. Um, check and verify that um, you haven't chafed through any line. Um, the examples of sea anchors failing, again, the number one cause is chafe followed by hardware parting under load. Now here in this uh, image you can see the sea anchor now. Um, we're, we're coming around, we're at about a 90 degree angle, a little less than a 90 degree angle actually. Um, as it is starting to set and pull boat around and we're now beginning to adjust the angle with the bridle to get the optimum angle to the parachute. And we can't see the parachute itself, but if you look out here you'll see the uh, float out in the distance. The process of retrieval uh, is important to discuss. Um, there are right and wrong ways to do it. Some are easier than others. I can tell you that retrieving the sea anchor um, was a smooth operation. It took about 20 minutes. Uh, first, uh, you'll need to retrieve and clear the bridle. And this may require powering forward because the bridle is going to be under considerable load and um, you need to take pressure off that bridle so you can you can begin to winch it in but uh, as you power forward and um, get all the load off it obviously before unshackling. And then with the crew member on the bow uh, remove all the chafe gear that was placed around the road and now you have some retrieval options and there are a number of ways to do this. Um, the first is you can just simply cast the road off the boat completely. Just throw it into the water, put a weight on it, some heavy shackles, and let it sink down to the bottom, and then power up to the float, and with a boat hook, just as you would grab a mooring, grab the float and bring it up on deck, and that'll collapse the parachute, and you can haul the parachute in. Another option is if you happen to rig a trip line, this gives you um, maybe another 150 feet or so of uh, sea room to work. You can power up while leaving this uh, road attached. You can haul in the road as you go, power up to the trip line, and then grab the trip line and haul it in and collapse the parachute. That has the advantage of not running over the parachute or putting you close quarters with it, and uh, but requires rigging a float. The other option is if you haven't rigged a float or a trip line, just power up to the float, but be careful to haul in the road as you go to make sure you don't foul the prop. And then with a boat hook, grab the primary float, pull it up on deck, collapse the parachute, and then haul in the rest of the road. The other option, one I don't recommend, but is seen in some published accounts, is to pre-rig a trip line on the um, parachute and run it all the way back to the boat and ride to a trip line while you're riding to the sea anchor. The problem I have with this is the risk for tangling and having that line cause more of a problem uh, later, especially in rough conditions. Uh, I think it's simpler not to rig that and uh, my personal choice would be to rig a trip line and to power up to the trip line. In this case, we didn't have a trip line, so we just powered up to the float and we retrieved the float. And so by powering forward, you bring your crew up on deck and while hauling in on the line, you approach the float and 
The problem here is that you're still dealing with a significant sea state and probably a significant amount of wind, and the boat is going to yaw around quite a bit, uh, port to starboard to port again, and so you need to have good hand signals with the helm so they know where the float is at any given time. Here we are approaching the float uh, near the top of a 25-foot wave, and then a moment later it was on the port side of the boat uh, doing the same thing. In this image, we're very close to the parachute, and um, it personally makes me a little nervous having a spinning prop offshore at close to all those shrouds. Well, we were successful in um, retrieving it on the first attempt by retrieving either the trip line bag or the float as it was rigged here, bring that up on deck and then pull the line to collapse the parachute, which then can be hauled on board. Take apart all of the hardware and stow it and take the parachute and keep it wet in a plastic garbage bag, a heavy duty garbage bag, and bury it in a lazarette somewhere. Don't let it dry out. The salt crystals that form are like sandpaper and will destroy a parachute. Uh, on short order. So you need to save this, wash it ashore, dry it in the shade out of direct sunlight, and then repack it. As you are already aware, storm conditions at sea are not always avoidable, but are fortunately uncommon. Uh, we try to avoid them whenever possible with um, a clear understanding of what causes heavy seas and uh, having our eye out for the weather. But advanced preparation is always the key to avoid injury to the crew and to the vessel. So before going offshore, I recommend that you make sure that you have suitable storm sails for your boat and sea anchor gear. And practice rigging this at the dock and in moderate to rugged sea conditions before you have to use it the first time in a storm. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the authors that have given consent for their materials to be used in this presentation. Um, Earl Hines, the author of Heavy Weather Tactics, Lynn and Larry Pardee, who have been very gracious, and their uh, Storm Tactics Handbook and DVD are excellent resources, and I recommend them to you. And Victor Shane, who is the author of the Drag Device Database book, if you purchase a sea anchor, it's recommended that you submit your case history to the drag device database. It serves as a authoritative and um, objective assessment of what works and what hasn't worked offshore and gets us away from a lot of the anecdotal talk that we hear from time to time based on individual experiences and gives us a combined benefit of multiple sailors and multiple vessels in varying sea conditions.